Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 10, The First Steppe Empire. To begin with, I would just like to let you know that every episode will now be getting a blog post on the website with useful maps, images and links. You will find a link to the post in the show notes for each episode. I think this will keep any supplementary materials well organised and easy to find. New episodes will have their blog posts as they are released, and I will try to get posts for the existing episodes up as soon as possible. If you are visiting the website, you will also see a bright green support button in the top right corner, where you can make a one-off donation to support the show. We have one more episode after this one to complete this look at the Indo-Iranic peoples, and then my plans for the next year include the second great steppe people, the Turks, running up to the Khazars and the Volga Bulgars, origins of the Finno-Ugric peoples, and the emergence of Balts and Slavs. There's tons of really interesting stuff to look at. And if you would like to help me make the podcast even better, please consider supporting. Now, on with the show. Over the last few episodes, we have looked at how the Scythians, nomads who left no writing or cities behind them, were rediscovered. The innovations in weapons that combined with their mounted mobile lifestyle and warrior culture to create key aspects of the steppe culture that endured for centuries, and what contemporary sedentary civilization, in the shape of Herodotus, wrote about their barbarian neighbours. In this episode, we return to the chronological narrative and look at how the Scythians appeared, what they did, and what happened to them. If we are going to talk about steppe peoples establishing nations and empires, it's worth taking a closer look at what we mean by certain terms. When we discuss Scythians, Huns, Turks, Mongols, we are not talking about ethnic groups in the same way that we might talk about modern Mongolians. On the steppe, and indeed among, for example, early Slavs, there was more of an open invitation to affiliation. At least some part of the Chimerians likely joined the Scythians, along with Greco-Scythians, Thracians and others. Greeks and Persians disagreed over which peoples were Scythians and which weren't. Hecateus said that the Melanchlini and Isodones were Scythians. Herodotus, who was maybe better informed after his stay in Olbia, said that they were not Scythians. This continued in later groups. There were Iranic peoples among the Huns and Turks among the Mongols. So, in the context of the steppe, when we talk about these different peoples, we mean a multi-ethnic grouping that has a common linguistic and material culture rather than an ethnically derived nation, as we tend to think of peoples today. Scholars use a number of terms to refer to various peoples. People itself is probably the most common term. When groups of peoples come together on the steppe, like the Huns, for instance, they are usually referred to as confederations. You can still find them called tribes, a word I have used occasionally myself. The word tribe is regarded as somewhat problematic. First, it has some colonialist baggage, as a term self-designated civilised peoples used when referring to uncivilised peoples. Second, it doesn't really tell us much. It means a group of people with some kind of relationship to each other, 
but those relationships may be defined differently by each people, and so what tribe means would be different for them too. So I will mostly just refer to them as peoples. For the Scythians, we have two approaches to who the Scythians were. First, there is the group of people that emerged from the Altai region and moved into the southern Russian Ukrainian steppe, the ones we might call Scythians proper. Second, there is the larger group of peoples that emerged from the Altai region over several centuries and established themselves over a larger area from the Altai to the Caspian steppe, including the Sarmatians or Sauramato, Saka, and Alans. These people are often all called Scythians, especially in the Russian literature, because they appear to share the same material culture, the Scythian triad of weapons, art, and horse riding that we discussed in episode 6, Rediscovering the Scythians, and they had a mutually intelligible language. Herodotus says that the Sarmatians spoke Scythian, but badly. Saka is a Persian word that is used to refer to the eastern Scythians based in the area that is now Kazakhstan, but in the Persian Empire it was used to refer to all the peoples we call Scythians. In this episode, I'm going to be looking at the first group, the Scythians proper, and their kingdom in the Caspian steppe. The next episode will cover the later Scythian peoples in the wider definition, and the Scythian legacy in general. The Indo-Iranic peoples that arose out of the Andronova and Sintashta cultures on the southeastern side of the Urals and in the Kazakh steppe migrated in all directions, giving rise to various similar and linguistically connected cultures across the steppe. The group that would become the Scythians first formed in the Altai region, while others ranged further east across much of what is now Mongolia and into the Chinese borderlands. Around 1000 BCE, the Indo-Iranians became the first people to move to a horse-based, mounted pastoral lifestyle. They were not the first to ride horses, but they were the first for whom riding horses became the basis of their lifestyle. Compared to the carts and chariots of the previous couple of thousand years, this meant an increase in speed, flexibility and effective range. And for warriors, it drastically expanded the available manpower. If you think back to episode 4 on the Sintashta, you'll recall that chariots were complex pieces of engineering that required considerable skilled labour to manufacture. For example, many of the chariots found in Egypt are from the Caucasus, implying that they had to be imported from specialist artisans rather than being made locally. Horses only needed to breed. If you had 50 men in your tribe, maybe you could have 10 chariots, but the Scythians could put all 50 men on a horse with a bow. The mounted archer became the basis of Scythian culture. The word Scythian is derived from the Iranic word Scutha, or archer. The first mention of the Scythians comes from the Near East in the 7th century BCE. But this is more likely to have been the first large-scale movement after a couple of hundred years of low-level migration. The Medes, also an Iranian people, had moved into northwestern Iran and established a kingdom that was facing off against the Assyrians. At this point, the Scythians and Chimerians invaded Media, possibly taking it over for a period, 
and thereby entered the historical record through Middle Eastern chronicles. As we heard in episode 7, Herodotus wrote that the Scythians had been displaced from their original eastern homeland by the Massagetae, another Iranian group that had originally migrated further east but had then been pushed back by the Chinese. The Massagetae will return to our story later, but for now, all you need to know is that they were the ones who triggered the Scythians' big migration to the west. It would take them a couple of centuries to reach what would be their new homeland en masse. After first concentrating in the North Caucasus Kuban Valley, they went on a bit of a rampage, raiding or signing on as mercenaries in wars from Anatolia to Egypt, especially for the Assyrians. Those trilobate Scythian arrows have been found at 7th and 6th century battle sites all over Mesopotamia, Syria and Egypt. They even made it into the Bible, with mentions in Genesis, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The list of peoples of the north in Genesis includes the Goma, a cognate of Gimarai, a variant of Chimerian, while Ashkenaz is the Assyrian form of Scythian. The prophet Jeremiah, promising punishment for misbehaving Israelites, stated, quote, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from all sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men for war against thee. End quote. The book of Jeremiah was written around the time that the Scythians were raiding their way down to Egypt, and you can imagine the impact that they must have had appearing out of alien lands, with strange clothes and unprecedented ways of fighting. That mounted archers were something new and strange in the ancient Near East, can also be seen in other parts of the Old Testament, where the Israelites destroyed the horses of their enemies instead of taking them for themselves, and Israel's future king is instructed not to keep horses. After the fall of the Assyrian Empire, the Medes reasserted themselves for one last time before absorption into the young Persian Empire. According to the story, the Scythian leaders were invited to a great feast. When they got drunk, the Medes poisoned them and then attacked the rest of the Scythians. The surviving Scythians fled north to the Pontic Steppe, returning to their home where they were met with hostility by the descendants of the wives and slaves they had left behind. Some scholars argue that this story, told in Herodotus, has some basis in fact. The Scythians do appear to have left the Near East quite quickly. They were famous for their drinking, and the references to them driving off their recalcitrant slaves with whips could correspond to the well-attested use of whips as a status symbol and weapon in the steppe. In any case, when they returned to their steppe, their time in the Middle East had given them a wealth of knowledge and experience in warfare and organisation. They continued to move westward, and by the 6th century they dominated the steppe from the Caucasus to the Danube. They absorbed the remnants of the Chimerians and other Iranian tribes on the steppe and exerted overlordship over Thracians and other agricultural peoples in the western reaches of their land and the sedentary foragers and herders in the forest on the northern borders of the steppe. The western steppe had a lot to offer them. The new Greek colonies on the Black Sea provided opportunities for trade. The landscape was similar to the east, but the milder climate enabled them to grow crops to sell, and sedentary peoples around the western and northern periphery 
or in Asia Minor, provided iron, furs, honey and slaves that could be raided. Therefore, as we discussed in the last episode, the Pontic Steppe put the Scythian lords in the position to acquire the wealth they needed to reward their followers and maintain their social system by opening up routes for the exchange of goods between peoples who would otherwise not be in contact. But goods were not the only commodity traded with the Greeks. Increasing numbers of Scythian slaves joined wheat and dried fish in the trade with Athens. In the middle of the 5th century BCE, Olbia underwent a boom which may have been driven by the slave trade in particular. Athenian records show that Scythians fetched a high price and were therefore particularly valued. Although they did have slaves, the Scythians did not have a slave-based economy themselves, and therefore it is quite likely that they raided other peoples to acquire them. In return, the Scythians acquired Greek wine and other goods. They had a particular reputation as drinkers, mocked by the Greeks for drinking their wine unwatered, and drunk Scythians turned up as the comic relief in Greek plays. Interestingly, Scythian slaves actually served as a kind of police force in Athens. Greek records show that Scythians, who may have been recruited from among mercenaries who had served alongside the Athenian army, were tasked with keeping the public order. At elections, they would round up reluctant voters and herd them into vote using a rope with paint, marking the shirkers. In Aristophanes' Lysistrata, it is the Scythian police who are sent to arrest Lysistrata. The idea of foreign slaves serving as police seems rather strange, and one theory put forward is that it was taboo for free Greeks to put their hands on each other, so they had a specially designated team of public slaves to perform this task when necessary. As the ties between them grew, some Scythians also seem to have acquired a Greek education. Anahasis was a philosopher from around Olbia. His father was Scythian and his mother was Greek. In the late 6th century, he travelled to Athens to study, making a name for himself as a kind of proto-cynic, with aphorisms like, Wise men speak, fools decide and earning enough respect to be granted Athenian citizenship. When he returned home, however, his brother shot him and killed him. Herodotus relates this tale to illustrate his opinion that the Scythians despise all foreign customs, and particularly those of the Greeks. But while this might have been true when they first rode out of the east, over time they would become increasingly tightly knit with the Black Sea colonies, and largely Hellenized. The history of the Scythian presence in the Pontic region is divided into three periods. The Archaic, from 750 BCE to 600. The Middle, from 600 to 400. And the Late, from 400 to 200. The initial migrations would have been fairly small, Of the slightly more than 3,000 Scythian graves found in the steppe, only a handful date to the 6th and 7th centuries. Along the edges of the forest belt, there is evidence that the indigenous peoples were extensively building forts in the 7th and 6th centuries, presumably in response to Scythian raiding, which seems to have extended as far as the Hungarian plain. But by the 5th century, these forts had been destroyed or abandoned, as the Scythians established their authority, and we can see local elites adopting Scythian-style burials. Herodotus describes some of the other peoples living within the territory ruled by the Scythians, the first steppe empire. Quote, The Calipedae, 
who are Scythian Greeks, and beyond them another tribe called the Alazones. Although they otherwise live like Scythians, these and the Calipede sow and eat corn and onions, garlic, lentils and millet. Above the Alazones dwell Scythian tillers of the land, who do not sow corn for eating, but for selling. North of these are the Nuri, and to the north of the Nuri, the land is uninhabited. End quote. Herodotus goes on to describe seven groups of Scythians and their locations, although his geography, as we move away from the north coast of the Black Sea, is more or less guesswork. The groups mentioned in the quotation a moment ago were the result of nomads mixing with the Greeks and cultivated the land. East of the Dnieper were the Olbiopolites, who controlled the territory running 11 days sailing northwards up the river. Beyond them were nomadic Scythians, up to the river Gerhus, and on the other side of that river were the royal Scythians, who he calls the bravest of the Scythian tribes, who look upon all other tribes as their slaves. Their domain ran to the river Don. So far, the identity of the Gerhus has not been determined. North of the royal Scythians were the Melanchlini, which means black robes, who Herodotus said were not Scythians. Finally, far away to the northeast, sharing land with the forest belt hunter gatherers, was a breakaway group of royal Scythians. Once again, although he gets some of the details wrong, Herodotus' picture of a confederation of Scythian groups with a range of lifestyles from pure nomadism to cultivation and trade, with an elite warrior group as overlords, generally comports with the historical evidence. The process of transitioning from migratory steppe pastoralism to a more settled life with increasing amounts of cultivation was happening right at the time Herodotus was writing. In the Archaic period, it was interactions around the periphery that were most significant for the Scythians. The excursions into Asia Minor brought Near Eastern influences into Scythian art, while the forest steppe introduced new trade goods and easier access to cultivation than in the more arid eastern steppe, stimulating the creation of new trading routes by the steppe nomads. In the middle period, the relationship with the Greek cities would be key. Recall episode 5 on the Bosporan Kingdom, and a war between two brothers with Scythian mercenaries fighting on both sides. As the Greek influence and trade increased, the Scythians tended more and more towards a settled lifestyle. They began to build large fortified settlements in the forest steppe zone, known as Gorodice, which enclosed very large for the time areas of 10 square kilometres or more. The remains of large metalworking workshops that must have employed hundreds of people have been found in these fortifications, along with holding areas for cattle. The Kamenskoy Gorodice has a 900 hectare site dedicated to metalworking, mainly iron, with substantial iron ore deposits available 60 kilometres away in Krivirich. Production on this kind of industrial scale would have needed an equally large amount of firewood to supply the furnaces, which was another reason to build them at the nodes of trading routes on the rivers in the forest steppe zone. The Gorodishu would have consolidated trade goods and tribute coming in from across the territory controlled by the Scythians for shipment onwards to the Greek cities. There, the Scythians picked up Greek ceramics and amphorae of wine for trade back to the Gorodice, where large quantities of both have been found. The most notable Gorodice, which we already mentioned in episode 7 looking at Herodotus, is the one found at Bilsk, a plateau near the river Vorskla, a tributary of the Dnieper. 
If you recall, some scholars have suggested that this site may be the remains of Gelonus, the massive Scythian fortress city that Herodotus refers to. The site covers 4,000 hectares, with 34 kilometres of ramparts and separate forts at the east and west ends. The eastern fort has earthquake ramparts 18 metres thick and 7 metres high, with a 6 metre deep ditch in front. It would have been topped with a timber palisade as well, although that has not survived to the modern day. The defences have been estimated to have required 11 million man days of work to build, and the fortress was in use from the mid 7th to the 3rd century BCE. The Gorodishu were likely used as bases by Scythian lords. Within each one, there was one or sometimes more additionally fortified citadels. The remains of large amounts of game have been found, and there are elite Kurgan burials nearby. It is likely that there would have been a permanent population of artisans working in metal production, possibly representatives of the Greek cities and other trading partners, while other herders, hunters and warriors would have come and gone with the seasons. Bone testing of remains from the sites shows that at least those Scythians who were resident in the settlements were beginning to add millet and other grain to their diet. This transition from a fully mobile lifestyle to a semi-sedentary or sedentary one, based on controlling transport hubs and the corresponding flows of wealth, would be characteristic of subsequent waves of migration out of the steppe. In the late period, a new wave of migration arrived from the east, led by the Sauramato, who we will look at in the next episode. They pushed the royal Scythians out of their land, and they moved west onto the river Bug and the lower Danube, where their fading power resulted in their defeat by Philip of Macedonia in 339 BCE. With the trade routes disrupted, Olbia went into decline. But the by now, but the, but the by now Greco-Scythian Bosporan kingdom continued to enjoy increasing prosperity. With the Sauromate, or Sarmatians, being a related Iranic people, the Greeks considered them to also be Scythians, and the Bosporan cities enjoyed a booming trade with them throughout the late Scythian period. In 331, Zopirian, the general Alexander the Great, had left in charge of Thrace, attacked Olbia. Scythian and Sarmatian defenders defeated them, but Olbia's time was ending. The Celts were moving in from the west, and the Bosporan kingdom became the centre of the surviving Scythian world. The Scythian kings moved into the Crimean Peninsula, where they built numerous fortified settlements with Greek stylistic features from the 3rd century BCE. The Scythian kings moved into the Crimean Peninsula, where they built numerous fortified settlements with Greek stylistic features, and from the 3rd century BCE they adopted a more Hellenized lifestyle. So, the history of the Scythian Empire can be seen as a model of how subsequent Central Eurasian empires emerging from the steppe would develop from then until the Golden Horde. First, they established dominance through military superiority over the existing population. But then their socio-political system, based on high levels of consumption and requiring ever more wealth to reward the leader's followers, drove increasing trade and commerce came to prevail. The trading networks they established linked the peoples around the periphery of the steppe, Western Europe, Asia Minor and the Mediterranean world, Central Asia and India and China, promoting and providing passage for goods and ideas, the Pax Scythica to the Pax Mongolica. They looked down on sedentary peoples, referring to city dwellers as slaves 
and considering them soft and ripe for plundering and exploitation. But their love for the good the cities produce eventually seduced them into assimilation and an ever more settled lifestyle, which in the end did indeed make them soft, leaving them to be overrun by the next wave of migrant warriors coming down the steppe funnel. In the next episode, we will complete our look at the Indo-Iranian wave of migration with the rest of the peoples who are variously regarded as also Scythians due to their shared material culture and linguistic identity, the Sarmatians, Saka and Alans, the end of Iranian dominance on the southern Russian steppe and their legacy. You can contact me through the Russian Empire History Podcast website, Facebook or Twitter, or by email at hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast dot com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next time. <laughs>